Jesus Christ said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I made a decision years ago that I wanted to be a part of the thing that God was doing. When Christ said, I am inventing something and I'm building something, I decided because the Lord had gotten a hold of my heart and drawn me to himself, it was a pretty simple move. I'm just going to attach myself to that thing that God is doing. Uh, get involved. Be plugged in in a part of the church. We, we talk about opportunities like Financial Peace University. And um, what, what a great class. Al Kerrig is teaching that once again, I think uh, third year to do that. And what a wonderful tool that uh, God has given us to become more like Jesus Christ in the way that we manage our finances. Uh, what Sherry was presenting absolutely coincides with our direction as a church, that we want to be out in this community. We talk about it every weekend, don't we? About being the scattered church. And so all of these partnerships are beginning to come online. And the, and the vision for that uh, is that it would create a movement of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that people in this community would begin to hear the name of the Lord through God's people on a regular basis, that there would be multiple interactions as we seek to meet needs. And so uh, take those opportunity, to opportunities seriously and seek to get involved. Um, I'm going to invite you to join me in scripture this morning in uh, John chapter 19, as we are winding our way down in the gospel of John. I hope you've enjoyed the study. Um, John chapter 19 is our passage. As we wind down the summer, I, I want to pray for something specific before I get into the message this morning. And I'm going to share a word, and you can respond emotionally to it if you choose. The word is school. Can you believe it's here? Some have started, some are getting ready to start. Uh, for some, it's your first time to go to school. Parents that are uh, dropping kids off for the first time and mixed emotions on some of that. Uh, I want to pray for our families on that. I was recalling as I was thinking about that, our son Josiah, his uh, first year in school, I think it was week number two, he was shocked to realize it wasn't optional. Yeah. <laughs> Horrified. And so we have some that will be experiencing this emotional roller coaster as we uh, transition once again into that time of year as families transition into that. So we just join me in praying for our teachers, uh, for our parents, for our students. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you've given to us, Lord, that you've given us this world to explore and to learn and to grow. Uh, Lord, we thank you for those that are teachers that uh, take the time, dedicate their lives to educate our young people. And Lord, I just pray that you will bless uh, our educators this fall. Give them a godly testimony. Give them influence for the kingdom and, I, and prosper them, I pray. Uh, Lord, I pray for the students that are uh, getting transitioned in. Lord, may it be a great start. I pray that our young people would see themselves as sent ones, that they are missionaries uh, in this world. Lord, that they carry with them the good news of Jesus Christ. And I pray that you will use them in a powerful way. Uh, bless our parents that are experiencing that transition as well, Lord. Give them peace. Give them wisdom as they guide that process for their young people. Uh, Lord, as we turn to your word now, we claim the promise that it would not return void. It would accomplish the thing whereunto you have sent it. So Lord, we pray that your spirit will take your word and apply it to our hearts this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, when I was uh, training for ministry, there were entire classes that would be focused on one category of doctrine. In fact, I would think they were taking pretty small categories to take a whole semester and talk about that when I first got going. Uh, for instance, there was one pretty early in my studies called soteriology. Anyone know what that means? It's the study of salvation. And uh, I looked at my syllabus, my course, I'm going to take 16 weeks on the study of salvation. And I thought, well, that's ridiculous. Salvation is simple. Jesus Christ, uh, crucified, buried, and risen again. Give me the final. I'm ready. <laughs> and then we got into the class. And yes, it was the simple message of the gospel of Jesus Christ and what he had done to procure our salvation. But it was a class that described all of the events that occurred, probably not even all of them, in fact, I know not all of them, began to get into describing the things that happened through that most powerful moment 
of salvation. And when the 16 weeks were done, uh, talking about things like justification and atonement and looking at the pre-incarnate Christ and how he was ordained before the foundation of the world for that moment in time. When 16 work, weeks were done, I remember thinking that wasn't enough. Like we just scratched the surface on that, that most important topic. Another one was called apologetics. You familiar with that one? Uh, I did not exactly know what that meant. I thought maybe it was 101 ways to say I'm sorry. Uh, but it was the defense of the faith. And you mix those two ideas together, and you have uh, a case for the cross of Jesus Christ as the focal point in human history, as the focal point, in fact, of Scripture and the focal point of our lives. And our study in the Gospel of John has brought us to that amazing event here today. And so uh, I know some are praying right now. I've prayed this week. Uh, I won't do it justice fully, uh, but we are going to look at the cross of Jesus Christ. And I want to I say this as we get going. It is the cross that is the pivotal moment. The entire Old Testament looked forward to it. The entire New Testament looks back to it. Jesus said as much in John 3 verse 14, which was earlier in our series. Uh, Christ speaking, he said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, remember the story from the book of Numbers, uh, the Israelites were complaining. Uh, God sent snakes along and the only way to be healed of the snake bite was to look at the pole and the serpent that Moses had erected on the pole. And by doing that, they would receive healing from the snake bites. And it was a picture going forward of the cross of Jesus Christ. And that's what Christ says. He says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. So the entire Old Testament points forward to that moment. The New Testament after Christ points back to that moment. Paul, for example, writing in 2 Corinthians 5, the love of Christ controls us, he writes, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died, and he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. In other words, the cross is why we do what we do. It impacts everything. The cross is that key moment. John Stott says it this way, the Christian community is a community of the cross, for it has been brought into being by the cross, and the focus of its worship is the lamb once slain, now glorified. So that's our, that's our focus here today, the cross of Jesus Christ. And I want to take some time this morning, and uh, I, I'm going to invite you to follow along with me. I want to just read this account uh, straight through, beginning in John chapter 19, right at the end of verse 16, and on through uh, the death of our Savior. I, I know uh, several have mentioned this summer in the, in the Gospel of John, we've done a little more reading through the text than what we've done in other series, and several have just mentioned how much you appreciate just the reading of the Word, uh, that it is the Word of God that is powerful, amen? Uh, so let's read this together, John chapter 19 and the end of verse 16. So they took Jesus... And he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus uh, was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but rather this man said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture which says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, 
Behold your mother. And from that time, from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. I want you to uh, think about those three words in John chapter 19 and verse 30. It is finished. All of humanity should be connected and is invited to connect it with those three words. It is finished. The purpose of Jesus Christ in coming to this earth, living the life that he lived, culminated in that moment and in that point when he would declare it is finished. And I want to invite you to experience the finished work of Jesus Christ. Whatever it is that uh, you're experiencing by way of strife, any stress in your life, the anxieties and the sin of life, it is finished. It's been nailed to the cross of Jesus Christ. That truly he has uh, borne our, our sins and carried our sorrows. And I invite you in a couple ways. One, if you have never personally interacted with that, that today you would receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. For those of you that have accepted Christ, are you living in light of the finished work of Jesus Christ? He's inviting us to, to rest, to stop, stop toiling, stop trying to earn it. Oh, we have salvation from the moment of faith, but we, we often go out and live each moment as if we, we still have to somehow earn uh, things in life, earn the favor of God. And he's invited us to rest. Now, yes, there's work for Christ, uh, but that work is far different once we've uh, rested, once we have accepted that Jesus Christ has, has paid it all and that he has a plan and that he's working his plan. It is finished. This is that, that key moment, the cross of Jesus Christ. And I want to apply it to our lives this morning in a couple of ways. One is by way of an apologetic. And that is defending the reality of the cross. Because it's only finished for you and for me if we embrace this event as a reality. It's not just a, an incredible story of selfless living, of sacrifice, or of love. Uh, we believe, our church teaches, this is what my life is built on, is that this is an actual event uh, that took place. And, and so I want to look at that and defend that for a moment this morning. And then I want to go back to chapter 19 earlier a little bit and look at a conversation that Christ had uh, with Pilate leading up to uh, that, that crucifixion. But thinking about defending the reality of the cross. There's two groups of people that need to hear that this morning. Uh, those that believe in Christ and those that do not yet believe in Christ. You say, well, why would a person that already believes in Christ and the cross need to hear that? Well, we always need to be growing in our faith, don't we? Uh, I like J.P. Moreland's definition of faith. He said, faith is embracing something with 51% certainty. It means that I believe it more than I don't believe it. The scale has tipped, and now I'm on that side. But we need to grow in our capacity, in our understanding, our belief. And so for me, uh, I continue to try to grow in my faith. And whenever I can see a defense of the reality of, of Jesus Christ and the cross, that helps me. The second reason for a believer to know this is to be able to share this. Uh, to constantly be sharpening our ability uh, to understand why it is we believe what we believe, what it is we believe, and to defend that. The second group, those that are not yet believers, uh, you're on a journey. Perhaps some of you are very aware that you're on a journey, and the goal of defending the faith is to get to that 51%, to get to that key moment when the scales tip, and you say, I, you may still have questions, but I see it. And I believe it more than I don't believe it that in fact Jesus Christ is the Savior, that the cross is a real event. And, and the strongest, uh, I think, apologetic for that we already mentioned is John 17, and that is the unity of the body loving one another. But there's some logic as well, and the logic is based on uh, witnesses. In fact, the Gospel of John is really a book about witnesses. Over and over again, John wanted to make it clear this actually happened. It's true. We have witnesses. Uh, someone tabulated eight witnesses in the Gospel of John. Uh, the father 
a witness to Jesus Christ as his son, the son about himself, the Holy Spirit. Uh, Jesus' works testify to his power. Uh, the other scriptures pointing to Jesus. Did you catch in the crucifixion story uh, the prophecies that were fulfilled, that these soldiers uh, cast lots, and the book of Isaiah describes that happening. Uh, John the Baptist, which was called Elijah to come, bore witness. Jesus' disciples, including John, bore witness to Christ, and then many others who encountered Christ. I want to focus on one witness, and that is the witness of the author of, of the Gospel of John, the disciple John himself. In fact, if you go down with me to verse 35 of John 19, uh, John declares himself to be an, an accurate witness. He, he writes this, He who saw it, speaking of himself, has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, that you also may believe. John includes himself as a reliable witness. Now, in a case, witnesses are of utmost importance, aren't they? New Testament scholar Leon Morris writes, John is insistent there is good evidence for the things he sets down. Witness establishes truth. Witness, did it actually, was it actually seen? Was it actually witnessed? One of the greatest reasons that the reality of the cross of Jesus Christ is rejected is because of this large category of miracles. Miracles as a whole are brought into question. I don't know if you've ever seen any documentaries on that. Uh, you can just search cable TV and you'll come across uh, places that will try to cast doubt on the miraculous claims of Scripture. Did Jesus actually turn water to wine? Jesus actually raise someone from the dead? Did the cross actually happen? Did the resurrection actually happen? Because it's this fascinating category called miracles. Do you ever find yourself questioning? I mean, this is some pretty outlandish stuff, isn't it? It's pretty far-fetched. Uh, why is that? It's because we don't see it happening all the time. Right? And we're experiential people. And so the line of reasoning goes like this. Wise people believe the ordinary. Miracles are not ordinary, so wise people don't believe them. It's a wrong argument, but that's, that's how it goes. In fact, it's really a wrong category. Uh, do you have your go-tos to win an argument? You have your like, wait, I'm going to, I'm going to, every time I'm going to trap, I, if I weren't a pastor, maybe I would have been an attorney. I like to trap a little bit, you know, and try to win. But I used to get into conversations with my brother-in-law and when I would trap him, he would just say, I'm right. <laughs> That's how he won the argument. Every time I'm right. Couldn't win. My, my twins have gotten into this argument. Now we'll, we'll go back and forth and we'll debate things. And then Austin will just say, dad, it's science, All right? <laughs> it's the end of it. It's science. The issue of, of Jesus Christ and the cross is not a matter of science. That's the wrong category. It's a matter of history. It, it's not whether or not it's normal or ordinary or unusual. It's a matter of witnesses. Did it actually happen? Uh, it's not normal or ordinary for presidents to be assassinated in a theater. But it happened, right? It, it was an out of ordinary event, but it's history. It's the wrong category. The category of the miraculous claims of Scripture, including the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, fall into the category of history based on witnesses. So the question becomes then, is, are there reliable witnesses? Is John a reliable witness to the truth of the cross of Jesus Christ? Uh, Greg Kokel. Uh, some of you might be familiar with that name. Uh, his uh, ministry called Stand to Reason, an excellent source for defending the faith. Uh, he quotes uh, chief judge in Minnesota, uh, the chief judge of the Court of Appeals, Edward Cleary. And Kokel on his website uh, quotes Edward Cleary, who states that when you're trying a case, you're looking at the credibility of a witness from five perspectives. Let's consider those five perspectives as it relates to John. John's claiming to be a credible witness. Is he credible? What are those five characteristics? Uh, let me read uh, what, what he writes. Number one, the first and most frequently employed is an attack by the proof uh, that the witness on a previous occasion has made statements inconsistent with his present testimony. In other words, is there a changing story? Did John ever change his story? There's no record 
that he did, he kept the same throughout. In fact, the disciples were very consistent in their story. F.F. Bruce wrote, one of the strong points in the original apostolic preaching is the confident appeal to the knowledge of the hearers, that their story was the same. Number two, the second attack on a witness is, is done by showing that the witness is biased on account of emotional influence, such as kinship for one party or hostility to another, or, or motives, whether legitimate or corrupt. In other words, this. Did the witness have self-serving motives? Now, at this point, you could argue a little bit that John may have, right? Because John uh, had a relationship with the Lord. They lived together. They walked and talked together for three years. He writes in glowing remarks about uh, the character of Christ and his affection. In fact, what was it that John referred to himself as when he would go through the Gospel of John? He would call himself the one that was loved, the one that Jesus loved. And so you say, well, there could be some self-serving interest, and that's true to a point. However, it really gets weak when you consider what it was that John would be facing for sticking to the story. Uh, that if, in fact, Jesus Christ uh, was, was crucified, but the miraculous part of the resurrection didn't happen, he, the selfish part is really gone at that moment. Uh, these guys knew exactly what they would be facing. In fact, they weren't the first group of people to claim such things, and others were definitely tortured, tormented, put to death for that kind of testimony. Uh, they were the only ones that had the number of witnesses uh, to this kind of a claim. Greg Kokel writing about uh, what these guys would face. He said, these men gave testimony in a hostile atmosphere. In the eyes of both the Jewish ruling authorities and the Romans, the proclamation of this message was a capital offense, a capital crime. For this testimony, they were crucified, fed to the lions, sacrificed by Roman gladiators, or beheaded. And one simple thing would have saved them from this torment, recanting. Uh, so selfish motive, uh, there to a point, but, but really gone at the moment of Jesus' death. Third attack on a witness would be, uh, according to the judge, uh, the character of a witness, a lack of integrity. And John, uh, from history, uh, had incredible integrity. Integrity means what? Practicing what we preach. That he followed through on the things that, that he was teaching. In fact, after scripture was done, and the last book was written, there was a guy by the name of Polycarp who uh, became a notable historian. Uh, other guys like uh, Tertullian uh, were influenced by Polycarp. He was a disciple of John, and his writings bear up to the testimony and the character of, John, of, of the disciple John. The fourth attack is showing incapacity uh, to observe, remember, or recount uh, matters testified about. In other words, incompetence. Um, John's competence uh, is noted by historians such as Josephus that uh, if you took the writings of early history and compiled them, you have, have almost the entire New Testament uh, reference to outside of the source of the Bible itself as a, a credible uh, witness uh, that this was in fact great storytelling. And some would say, well, what about the facts of the miracles and the memory? Because memory fades after a while, doesn't it? Um, I tell stories, and I think I'm getting them right. My wife is quick to let me know I missed up a couple facts, you know. There was this really cool couple um, when I was pastor in Illinois. They were in their 90s, and together they told great stories. He was the storyteller with all of the expression and uh, told it in the many colors, and she had all the facts. And it was so cool the way they would tell him. He would say, I met this guy named, and she'd say, John. And he'd say, we met uh, back in, and she'd say, 1956. And it was incredible, like the, the way that they would work through that. One of the reasons why the stories in, in Scripture, in New Testament, and the events of Jesus are so credible is because there was, it wasn't like there was just one miracle. It wasn't just this one anomaly that stood out. It was over and over again. It was abundant, uh, so much so that after Jesus' death and then his resurrection, and, and some were, of course, doubting the resurrection, uh, one comment said, the, these things have not been done in a corner. Someone claimed to not hear about it. It was actually Jesus incognito on the road to Emmaus, acting like he hadn't heard. And basically, the one talking to Jesus said, have you been living under a rock? Like, this has been so prevalent. Many miracles, obvious testimony, many witnesses. 
The fifth attack on a credible witness would be proof by other witnesses that the material facts are otherwise than as testified uh, to by the witness under attack. In other words, there are inaccuracies. But here again, John shows himself to be a very reliable witness, that he gives a story that shows uh, a great cooperation, not a collaboration, on the events of the cross of Jesus Christ. And uh, early church history testifies to that. The other writers of scripture, you say, well, you can't prove a book within a book. This is not a book, all right? This is a library of books. And it's multiple people over many years apart writing about the same events, the historical accuracy of the cross of Jesus Christ. In fact, I want to propose to you this morning that often our skepticism on the teachings of scripture and the amazing claims like Jesus Christ crucified and risen again are, are not based on a lack of evidence or a lack of facts, but actually on personal preference. That we are, in fact, according to the book of Romans, and I find this in my own self, a, we are suppressors of truth. There are, there are parts of the story that we may not like. Let me, uh, and so we base belief off of personal preference, and that's a very dangerous thing to do. Let me give myself as an example. Um, when it comes to scripture, I like it. I like the big picture of it. I, I love the fact that picture ultimately portrays a God who loves me and that gave himself for me, that wants to, for whatever reason, have a relationship with me. I see that all throughout scripture. And the cross of Jesus Christ is the greatest act of love. I like the big picture. I love many of the individual facts. I like the fact that God will never leave me or forsake me. I like salvation, eternal life. I'm, 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 I'm pretty high on that one. Uh, forgiveness from sins, uh, justice, and the list goes on. There are many things in scripture that I, that I really appreciate, that I really like. But perhaps like you, I struggle at times with some aspects in my humanity and in my flesh. And I know you do too. Uh, collected the uh, feedback from our controversial Jesus series. We're starting that, Lord willing, here in two weeks, taking four weeks answering uh, some of the most prominent questions that you expressed, those of you that responded, and many responded. By far, 25% of you, your biggest question, if you could ask Jesus anything, revolved around, worded in different ways, but under the larger category, if God is so good, why is there evil in the world? I admit, there are things in Scripture that I wrestle with. In my humanity, I'm not sure that I like them. I, in fact, I'm sure that I don't like them. Now, my faith is such, and I have believed in God to the point that I truly believe that He sees what I don't see. And the day is coming when I will get it at a deeper level. But, but even aside from that, it's not about whether or not I like what Scripture is teaching. Because if it's true, then I need to face the reality. And it was reality that drove me ultimately into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Yes, it was his love, it was his kindness and his, uh, his work for me on the cross. But it was the reality of my sin. It was the reality of a God who deals with sin. I didn't like that reality. That was, a, that was very convicting for me. That was a very uneasy season in life. But it was that reality that became so plain to me that I could not default to my personal preference. I cannot afford to make it about personal preference. Facts are facts, and I didn't make myself, I didn't make this world and this universe, and I didn't make the rules. And please understand, I am not against the teachings of Scripture. I love the teachings of Scripture. But I know that there are hard things. But is it true? Is it reality? A philosopher by the name of uh, Pascal proposed this. And I, I just want to share this quickly. Wherever you're at on your journey, and I'm talking to those that are not yet at the 51% here. 
but you're on the journey. And maybe your biggest struggle has been some of the evil in the, in the world and some of the stuff we see in Scripture, the hard, the hard things. Pascal's wager, as it's come to be known, was, was really this. And it doesn't get us all the way there, but, but at least it heads us in the direction that I'm sharing a little bit this morning. We've got two choices on Jesus. We either accept him or we don't. We either believe that he is the Christ, died on the cross and rose again, or we don't. Maybe we believe parts, but I'm saying either we believe the whole story or we don't. Pascal's wager was this. If you choose to believe and you're wrong, it's very small loss. What have you lost? A few days in this fleeting world. If you choose not to believe and you're wrong, it's infinite loss. It's eternal loss. Now, that's not enough to get us to salvation because it's not a just give it a shot kind of belief. I've, I've personally interacted and, and attempted to disciple people that in hindsight were just kind of trying it and giving. So that's not enough. You got you to gotta believe it. I just want to challenge you to think deeply about your disbelief and what might be driving that. Is it because really there's not enough evidence for the truth of Jesus Christ? Or would you say I'm a truth suppressor? Would you have an honest moment and say there is something even now as the truth is being proclaimed that wells up inside me that is convincing me that Jesus Christ and his cross and his resurrection are a reality? Then I invite you to consider that at a deeper level. Believe the good news of Jesus Christ and his cross. Here's my conclusion on the whole, the hard things in Scripture. And we're going to deal with this in our series coming up on, on the hard things. But I'll just say this, uh, and, and I've got this on the screens if you want to uh, take note of this. If we were good like God is good and could see what God can see, we would do what God does. That there is a perspective. Now, those are big ifs because we're not good like God is good. And we don't see what God can see. But that's our faith. That's our belief. I want to close our time talking about uh, the cross of Jesus Christ from the perspective of those that did him in. And I want to relate it to your life for just a moment because there are those that either have kind of done you in or are seeking to do you in. And I want to just take you back for a moment uh, before he's handed over to the Roman soldiers for the cruci uh, crucifixion. And I want to invite you to take time. I don't have all the time to go through. There's a fascinating exchange between Pilate and Jesus. Are you familiar with that? And Pilate's response or his disposition is he didn't want anything to do with this guy. I mean, it's so clear in the Gospel of John. He was an authoritative man. He needed to cooperate. History tells us he and Caiaphas, the chief priest, needed to really cooperate with one another. Uh, it was a good thing. They could get a lot done if the religious leader and the political leader were in cahoots. And Caiaphas clearly wanted Christ in, incarcerated. He wanted him to put to death, in fact. Pilate didn't want anything to do with it. Uh, for one, his wife had a dream about Jesus, and she came out and said, don't have anything to do with him. Pilate was very concerned when Jesus claimed himself to be God. Um, extra biblical resources, and I, you know, we take them for what they are, a grain of salt, claim that actually Pilate became a believer uh, in Jesus Christ. We may spend eternity uh, with him. We'll have some questions, right? Uh, but the exchange with Pilate and Jesus was interesting. I just want to read a small part of it for you in verse number 9 of John 19. It says that he entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, Pilate said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave no answer. He was just quiet before him. So Pilate said to him, you will not speak to me. Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? And I love Christ's answer to him in verse 11. You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. I think he's talking about Caiaphas having the greater sin who delivered him over. Could have been Judas, uh, could have been Satan himself. I think it was probably Caiaphas. But notice that answer. You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. The same thing is true in your life and in mine. That the events of our lives are only events if God allows them. A friend of mine, Ron, had worked at a company uh, back in Illinois uh, for many years, and he was due for a promotion. He ended up being passed over for that promotion uh, so that it could be given to a relative of his employer. 
and the employer was trying to backpedal out of that, you know, and explain himself and make apologies. And I love Ron's response. He said to him, if God wanted me to have that promotion, there was nothing you could have done about it. Same idea. There's no authority unless God gives it. That in fact, Jesus Christ was not victimized. He was a willing participant for you and for me. That God is at work even through the disappointments of life. I want to ask you to bow with me uh, at this time. And I want to invite you to consider your own relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And this morning primarily has been uh, an appeal to those who do not yet believe in Christ. Maybe there's things that you believe about Jesus, but that's not enough. It's believing the whole story, that he's the son of God who was crucified, that when he died and said it is finished, uh, that, that it was over, that, that there's nothing we could add to it, and that his resurrection is a reality. Maybe this morning you would embrace that. Maybe you've been coming here for a while and you've been tracking with the series and the Lord's been working in your heart and in your life. Maybe it's even been a number of years, but today would be your day of salvation. There has to be a point. We don't evolve into salvation. There has to be a point in a moment of belief and maybe this would be your moment. Would you follow me in the simple prayer of receiving Christ? Dear God, I humbly come to you today admitting to you that I am a sinful person in need of a savior, in need of forgiveness. And today I am embracing Jesus Christ as my savior. I am believing that when he died on the cross, it was finished for me. That my sins will no longer be held against me. I believe that he rose from the grave, conquering death for me. And this morning is my day. I'm coming to you now, God, in faith, believing in Jesus Christ, receiving him as my Savior. If you uh, prayed that to the Lord today, uh, more importantly, if you believed that, because it's the belief that saves, it's no words, it's no prayer, then you are God's child. I... I wonder how this impacts you that believe in Jesus Christ already, seeing the cross of Jesus Christ and knowing that what he has done for us, that it is finished. What are the areas of life that you're holding on to? That instead of giving them to the Lord and realizing that he has paid for it all, you're still trying to manage, you're still trying to plow through. Won't you see the cross of Jesus Christ as effective not only for one moment in decision, but for every day, for every moment? Our Heavenly Father, I thank you for the cross of Jesus Christ. I thank you for loving us enough to send him here for us. Lord, that even before you made the world, you had this in mind. Uh, knowing the end from the beginning, knowing that we would turn our backs on you. Through Adam, we inherited sin. All of us expressed that sin personally but you've loved us enough to give us Jesus Christ. May we never grow tired of that reality. And may we operate out of that reality every day. That through Christ, we have died to our old self, to our old sins, to our own attempts to make life go. And Lord, now we go in a new strength, the power of your Holy Spirit, all because of the cross of Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, I pray that that will become an, an everyday reality for us. Lord, for those that just believed in Christ, uh, Lord, I pray that you would move in their hearts to know that they are your child. Uh, may they receive that, but, but may they also reach out, Lord, to us as a church, and, and we want to walk with them through that. And so, Lord, I pray that, uh, that you'll be very real right now in the heart of one who just received, uh, to know that your spirit is in them. And that this is the beginning, really, of the journey where you will begin to, to change them and to grow them, that they are on the adventure of, of, of an eternity with you. And so, Lord, we thank you for all of that. We pray for your work in Jesus' name. Amen.